What's going on people? This is Jay Ghost and I'm going to be talking about Peter Moore. Now, this is an article from Games Industry. I'm mainly going to be going over it, summarizing what I see in it, as well as trying to sit here and translate exactly what Peter Moore is saying and some of the things that he's talking about. Now, in the beginning, let me go ahead and tell you exactly why I don't like Peter Moore. Now, a few years ago, I think it was around 2004, he was part of the uh, Microsoft crew. He was VP. I don't exactly know where, and I'm going to have a link in the underbar. And one of the things that I enjoyed was when Dan Su sat here, dropped the mic on his happy ass, and basically showed Peter Moore and explained to him the problems with the Xbox in the biggest way possible. That was actual journalism. That was actual integrity. And he asked some really, really hard questions and interesting questions to get one of the most interesting and intriguing uh, interviews that I've seen in a long time. Now, nowadays, we have a whole bunch of people that are faking it until they make it. And, like, for example, Jim Sterling just today had to apologize because he made some stupid remark about how he only wanted to, he wanted to have diversity in his crowd by only focusing on people outside of straight white males. Racist as fuck. And stupid and ignorant, but he's done that type of stuff with other things, so I'm really not paying attention to it. But my point is, Peter Moore got interviewed, and he did pretty well for himself. He defended himself, but Dan actually asked him some very, very hard questions, something that I have a lot of respect for. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go over the interview, because what he's saying here is that the game industry is going to have the same fate as a pre-Napster music industry. That's a bold claim. So that's something that I want to sit here and I want to go ahead and discuss right here, right now. Now, we go into the first paragraph where it talks about how he's optimistic about the gaming industry. Now, he was talking to Games Industry International and he said this is, you know, an up, upbeat type of thing. But when he gets into the second article, or a second paragraph, he talks about how we're going into a golden age of gaming. Now let's just stop here for just one moment. The golden age of gaming came about because consumers were buying money, we weren't in a recession, and on top of a golden age, we had all the systems that were doing rather well, they were competing, but that's more nostalgia. Now, the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo would probably be a quote-unquote golden age, but this seems a lot more marketing speed. What he's talking about in this context, he says, I think we're going into almost a golden age of gaming. That's a caveat. That's a dodge. That almost. Where it doesn't matter where you are at any time, any place, any price point, key point, any amount of time, there's a game available to you. So that, guess what he wants to do? And let's go ahead and let's read the rest. And our job as a company is to provide these game experiences. And then on our big franchises, tie them all together. So let's translate this for just one moment. He said that he wants you to have a game for practically anybody in any market at any price point. He wants to have something that EA has to make more money. That's what his company is going to be doing. And then on top of that, with the big franchises, such as Dragon Age, Mass Effect, and all of these others, what he wants to do is sit down and say, all of those franchises have microtransactions in some way, shape, or form. And let's go ahead and go to the third paragraph. A natural extension of EA's games as a service approach, which we already know actually happens through GOG as well as Valve. So this is supposedly something that Moore is, has been pushing for years, but I'm going to go against that because he's been vice president for a hell of a long time. He's just telling you what you want to hear. But he wants to say that you want to have an ultimate team mode in EA Sports games with a console component, a phone, and tablet app that all have the same environment, which really can't happen because... All of those have to be programmed differently. That all has costs, sunk costs, 
etc etc i'm not going to get too much into it but what he's saying is he wants to have that traditional retail model with the free to play business model downloadable content constantly connected experiences which not everybody is actually agreeing it's beneficial now let me sit here and let me put this to you really quickly if ea wanted to change their entire business model overnight they would have free to play for their football teams dedicated servers dedicated fantasy leagues and they would be innovating in that space but they choose not to because the money is too lucrative by having people that buy $60 games on Madden knowing full well that by the time the next year comes around that game is already done and for the most part after two or three years they start reappropriating re the servers for something entirely different why not have it so that the graphics can be updated you can have one particular game make it free to play free to download and then have people move on and decide what they want to engage in I, I could give ideas I'll probably give ideas later on I'm gonna keep going with the article for this time being I think the challenge sometimes is that the growth of gaming, there's a core that doesn't feel quite comfortable with that. Now, what he's talking about is the critics like me, and I don't really play EA games, I do have them. And I'll probably be playing them, but I won't play on Origin. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, he talks about games industry that business readers how they don't get frustrated, but he scratches his head and says, look, these are different times. What does that mean? They're, these are different times. Whatever. Each different time, the 90s is different from the 80s, there's different and more powerful systems, and different consumers come in with different expectations. We know this. But EA is saying that he wants to embrace them. Now, if EA was embracing anybody, they would have sat here and looked at the Sim City fiasco in a very, very, very different light, along with with the Dungeon Keeper fiasco and every last fiasco that sits here and keeps getting them more and more um, flare back. I mean, right now Ubisoft is really, really big in this, but EA has been complicit in that in that search for the perfect microtransaction. So I don't want to hear that they're embracing their fans, their readers, or the industry, because they're really not. But they say that it's a prior primordial soup and business models that people are interested in playing games. He sees it as a net positive, but acknowledges not everyone agrees. And of course, I mean, the eighth generation of gaming is not really all that good and not really all that well doing versus the seventh generation, which is still going. So there's a problem here. Now, there is a core controversial statement coming from me, sadly, that just doesn't like that because it's different, it's disruptive. I, it's not the way it used to be. So what? I used to put my disc in the tray or my cartridge in the top and I'd sit there and play. And all of these young people coming in, or God forbid, these old people coming in the game. That's what he's saying. What does that mean, though? I, I can't really translate this, so I'll go move on. The changing makeup of the gaming audience has convinced EA to rethink its development philosophy a bit. When Moore first joined EA, he said the company had 67 core games on consoles and PC that were either in full development, about to be launched, or had just been released. I'm calling bullshit on that. I don't know exactly when he came in, but I was following when they were in the 80s. I was following in the 90s. Um, in the 90s, they had a very, very diverse array of people that were publishing, and the developers were in charge, kind of like Square. When the developers were in charge, they made the games that they wanted, and people actually played them, such as we got Road Rage, we got Mutant League Football, along with Madden. And then when the CEO started taking over these companies, where they started to buy out, I believe that was in 1995, such as Westwood Studios and on and on that's when they became very very conglomerate so this whole thing about 67 core games it seems more of a dodge and it doesn't really it smacks in the face of ea's history at least to me but let's continue onward 
Now, he says since then, the company has changed strategy away from the launch and leave or fire and forget model that used to dominate the industry. Again, you can look at EA and you can look at their Madden series and you can see that they still continue to do the fire and forget model. So, again, that's horseshit. Now, Games as a Service said that 35% of the company's staff is involved in live ops, providing support services, or developing extra content or games that have already launched. Now, he said the company averages about 11 or 12 games a year. But this is all meaningless. I mean, for the most part, he's throwing stats to sit here and say, look at this, we have a customer, ser customer service, and our customer service is better than anybody else's. I think that's just a blatant attack, and... It's really not convenient to the article. It's a completely different approach in the way we're listening to gamers and the way they want to consume games. Again, changes, changes, uh, tastes have changed, so the gamers have changed as well. I mean, some of them have gotten older. So what? What does this mean? That really is nothing more than probably, um, corporate speak. So let's continue on. The advent of social media, the entire industry has changed the way it listens to consumers, such as the Twitter reactions um, to the EA media briefing, where it showed off the early looks of the Star Wars series, Mirror's Edge, and Mass Effect games, as well as glimpses of some untitled Bioware and Criterion projects. Now, some of the people loved it, some of the people hated it, and some of the people were calling BS on the prototypes. And for the most part, what is saying it here is publishers were no different in the old days and just don't do like that. Don't like to do that. Like show things years in advance. Um, Mirror's Edge. A lot of people know that Anita Sarkeesian was supposedly involved with it, consulting with it. I don't think she had any input into the game except to say that, you know, this was a private event. So, she really only has it as a private event um, on her Feminist Frequency page. So, whatever was said there, it was just said and we haven't heard much about it. So, a lot of people are fretting about that game, especially with the open, it's supposed to be open world. I don't know. There's not been anything said about it. It's a pet project. So, I can't really sit here and talk too much about it. Do I want to see it? I still have to play the first Mirror's Edge and understand what's going on before I can sit here and comment on the second one. So I'll take I'll take it as it comes. Um, people aren't exposed to as much feedback as they are on Twitter, and Twitter is brutal. So what that says is he's determined to have the community involved in the company's business going forward, which if you really want to have them involved in this in the business you really want to listen to a lot more than twitter but uh, i'm going to keep going you have to embrace the social media as a plus rather than a negative gee you think okay everyone has a megaphone now everybody has an opinion and you learn to filter rant from the constructive feedback and i don't don't think peter moore does that quite as well but i'm going to keep going okay now he's crediting fan feedback with the speed franchise and taking a break which god for thank god but more to the story i think when they started rehashing need for speed over and over like most wanted um carbon and then all of that they finally recognized that there was market fatigue going on so i'm going to skip that part because that is a pretty good part i really actually do like that part about them um They've adopted a franchise from Criterion because they did give it to a new developer, Ghost Games. So, let's continue onward. Moore said that all these innovations are working to broaden the audience of gamers, and that's seen as unappealingly disruptive to a core audience who liked the industry just the way it was. Who likes the industry just the way it was? Um, unless you're talking about sports gamers, they've been doing that same thing over and over and buying the same game every year so I, that doesn't make any sense that just seems more and more like corporate speak to try to sit here and alienate some gamers instead of trying to be more progressive so what he's saying here which is where why i had to sit here and focus on this article in the first place 
He says, we just have to embrace it. We as an industry have to embrace change. We can't be music. We cannot be music. Because music said, screw you. You're going to buy a CD for $16.99. And we're going to put 14 songs on there. Two of which you care about. But you're going to buy our CD. Then Sean Fanning came. Writes a few lines of code. Napster happens and the consumers take control. So basically what he's said here is. He's willing to give consumers just enough control to feel like they do control something, but he still wants to hold on to that control for himself. So, now after that, of course, we do know that Apple introduced iTunes, and we had a more consumer-friendly way of acquiring music, but the recording industry is still trying to fight change to this day. And they're still trying to fight for more copyright, more surveillance of copyright, to make sure that everybody that actually listens to their music is not using their music and it's getting freaking annoying about particularly in regards to youtube but that's another rant for another time i'm going to keep going on creating music to sell is no longer a profitable concern the business model has changed to to concerts corporate concerts merchandise and things of that nature now actually selling music is not a way of making money anymore except for a core group again if well, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. But for me, when you're selling music, that can be done by independent artists. And what he's doing here, he's still talking about the labels, but not really talking about them. They sell music primarily. They still make billions of dollars. But the problem is that they shut out the individual artists and they're trying to do that through YouTube and everything else such as controlling Spotify and everything that most artists can do. And there's a whole thing about corporate or copyright, which I can go into. I may go into that later on and talking about the business model of copyright and copyright enforcement. But that's, again, another story for another time. Now, he says he believes he understands a lot of the misgivings people express about new business models, but... He says he's coming up, he's coming into this as a traditionalist, particularly when it comes to sports, which he hasn't changed the rules quite yet. So bear in mind. And what he's basically saying is that he is looking to make disruptive changes, but he's willing to do it a little bit slower. That's what that whole article reads to me, particularly because he has to be open minded, but he's still one of those people that needs that control. That's the same with EA. So let's go ahead, go to the next article paragraph. I think the core audience that dislikes the fact that there are play for free games and microtransactions built into those, fine. I get that. As you know, I read all the stuff and it is the most intelligent commentary on the web as regards games. There's no doubt about that. But every now and then, you and you've seen me do it. Somebody will come in there and say something stupid that I think is beneath the site itself and beneath the industry. Basically, if there's criticism, he's going to sit here and dismiss it as trolling. That's what I find there. Now, while Moore can be compelled to join the comment section on occasion, he sees the trends at work as being beyond one person's ability to impact. And, of course, keep away from comments. Hide the comments. He does read them, but he interprets them differently. So, I guess I can understand that. I don't think anybody has to like it. I think that's where it goes. It's like me. I get grumpy about some things. But if the river of progress is flowing and I'm trying to paddle my canoe in the opposite direction, then eventually I'm just going to lose out. From the perspective of what needs to happen in this industry, we need to embrace the fact that billions of people are playing games now. And there's plenty of people. And I'm going to be looking into the rest of this interview to make sure that I haven't missed anything. But the fact of the matter is, I do find some problems with more and what he has to say here but of course he does make some good points my problem and my issue is he he is looking to do more of the same and if they're not really innovating in sports such as football fifa and everything else which a lot of people are starting to clamor for i think he's going to be losing out and let's hope and see that he does the things that he aims to do or if he's just going to let that control thing kind of swing them Other than that, I don't really have much to say on the article, and I'll see you all next time.